rescue British holidaymakers trapped in Greece is on. If your loved ones are out there, or if you're due to travel in the next few weeks, well, Matt Allwright has some useful advice for you on today's show. Plus, as cases of norovirus on cruise ships skyrocket, Dr Range tells us why alcohol-based hand sanitizer won't always protect you. And we speak to the stars of the gripping BBC crime drama, The Sixth Commandment, that's based on a true... Hello, welcome to Morning Live. Good morning from me and Helen. Good morning to Matt Allwright, Dr. Range, and Maria's here as well as Strictly Pro for uh, Strictly Fitness a bit later on. Lovely to see you all. Lots to get through this morning. We're talking about asbestos, which is actually built into the fabric of some schools. It sounds really scary, but in about 20 minutes, Dr. Range will reassure us. Then straight after that, we're learning about screen time, dreaded screen time, and why what children watch is more important than how long they're in front of their devices. But first, we are continuing to follow the story of devastating wildfires in Greece, which are forcing families to flee hotels, sleep in schools, airports, sports centres. It's estimated 10,000 Brits are in roads. And just this morning, we've heard that the island of Crete is now also at risk. Yeah. Although repatriation flights are now starting to bring people home. Matt, those, those images, just so frightening, aren't they? Yeah, they really are. And they're really casting a light on, onto the holiday industry as well, insurance particularly, what it covers, what it doesn't cover now. A lot of people feeling maybe they should have read their policies a little bit more closely. It's going to be fascinating to see how, how this plays out. Lots of questions, aren't they? Yeah. Yeah. And you've got some answers for us. We're going to get to that. But we're going to speak to somebody who is affected. Catherine is stuck in Rhodes with her four children. She joins us now. Catherine, you were evacuated from your hotel on Friday. Talk us through what happened. It was, I, I think it was Saturday um, we evacuated. We woke up in the morning um, and when we went outside to the Sunbirds, it was like it was sunset. There was a very orange hue everywhere. It was very cloudy. I thought it was just cloudy. Um, and then we realised it was smoke. Um, went round the corner, could see crowds around the corner in that photograph now, having a look, went round there and realised that um, it was pretty bad. The seaplanes were out dropping water and by three o'clock in the afternoon it had got much better um, and other hotels were being evacuated to our hotels. So we were fairly complacent, thinking, well, if they're bringing people here, we're OK. Um, and it seemed to be OK in the afternoon. And when we came out at 7, there was a distinctive orange glow on the skyline. And it was getting worse literally by the minute. By 9 o'clock, it was obvious that um, we were very likely to be evacuated. Um, and at 10 o'clock, we got the call, right, go. You've got a couple of minutes to grab essentials and then please go outside. So. There was a large crowd um, gathered and we just started walking. We didn't know where we were going um, or how long we were, you know, how long it was going to take. So there was quite a panic. We got out onto the road outside and there were cattle trucks and one bus. There was a huge panic by people to get on to the transport. Um, we were actually only going a couple of miles down the road. And I think if we'd been told that that's where we were going, there would have been less panic because people would have chosen to walk. But as it was, nobody knew how far we were going. So oh there was goodness. huge um, melee of people trying to get on, on, these, on these trucks and not be separate, and the families not being separated. And when I got on, there was some very distressed children at the back of the truck where I was who didn't know where their parents were. Um, in fact, they were on the truck. Um, we drove for five minutes and then the truck stopped. I, my understanding is that it had broken down. We just were then pointed down the road, just walked down there. So again, no idea where we were going. It was pitch black. We got to the beach um, and there, were already a, there was already a significant crowd there. And um, nobody knew what was going on. Somebody said they they thought we were there to be picked up off off the beach by boats. 
And in fact, friends at home had sent me news reports that day saying the plan was to evacuate yeah, and, by and, sea. And Catherine, that's been happening quite a bit, isn't it? And it's, it's horrific yeah. hearing these stories from, from when it first happened to where you are now. We are so glad that you're safe and sound. Can we just ask you what, what's happened in terms of uh, the organisation of this? What have TUI told you? Um, very little. So we, tr we travelled all night by sea. Um, we then arrived at a, at a school. There were lots, there were, must have been a thousand people getting off the ferries and there were different buses taking everyone to different places. We were taken to a school. There was no one there when we arrived. Um, I'd had a text from TUI with emergency numbers, like the FCO number, for instance. Um, because a lot of people didn't have passports, but we did. Um, and we hunt, we, it was obvious that it was going to be chaotic. So as soon as we arrived at the school, I got on onto the web and started looking for a hotel room. Yeah. And, and you, you were one of the lucky ones that managed to find that hotel room. But I, I think I got the last hotel room in Rhodes. Yeah. Oh my goodness. It's just worth acknowledging the, you know, the Greek residents though, isn't it? In, in amongst all this chaos, they're opening schools, they're opening sports centres and showing hospitality at a time of, of loss yeah, for them absolutely. as well. Yeah, of course, the locals. Yeah, absolutely. Let's... The, the locals have been amazing. They, they, a, a little army of Greek ladies turned up at the school with a, a lot of food and water um, and you know, some of them were crying and hugging us and saying sorry and... It, it seems so inappropriate to me because there are people here who've lost everything and we've just had a ruined holiday. Yeah, but Catherine, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Uh, we're also going to chat to, to Liam. Um, I think he's a step closer to getting home. Am I right in saying that, Liam? You're in Rhodes. You were in Rhodes, but now you're in Athens. Yeah, so after this call, I've literally got to the airport now. Um, so, yeah, so... Oh, my but goodness. Be back yeah. Tonight, so do not miss that uh, flight. Can you just briefly tell us what happened to you? Uh, so, yeah, so we were on the beach uh, with my family, seeing uh, a part of the smoke uh, in the air. Um, didn't think much of it, but it was getting um, really worse. Um, so we were like, just covering the sun, so we were like, right, we've got to get back to the, uh, the hotel just in case something is going on. Uh, so we tried to... So we got a short bus uh, from the beach to back to the hotel. But it was shut, that the road was shut to get to our hotel, so we had to go to a sister hotel. Um, so we were there for half an hour, but it was getting worse. We could see the helicopter pick up water, and we were like, we need to get our passports, we have nothing else. So we uh, we managed to uh, to get a shuttle bus um, past the police. Uh, we shouldn't have went to the but but um, we just we needed to get the passports and our luggage. Uh, so when we got to the, uh, the hotel, it was sort of pumping and you know, we could see the smoke was getting worse. Uh, people were just running out of the buildings. Uh, so we quickly got to our apartments, packed everything up, uh, went in the back of our apartments, and you could just see the, the flames. Uh, it was getting really bad. Uh, then we, uh, we left the, the room. Um, and then literally every scream and get out, get out, get out. We were, we were probably one of the last ones, the last families to get out of there, to be honest. All the staff had already gone and it was derelict. And then they were, um, we met with shouting in trucks, run, run down the dirt track. Um, we managed uh, a guy uh, threw us on the back of his truck um, with my kids. The kids were just traumatized. Uh, that was scream. Um, so we. It, we told to keep our heads down, so we got moved to another hotel, a sister hotel just down the road, uh, where we were before. Uh, but then there was already buses there, uh, loading up to get to Gennady, because uh, that was the next safe side. Um, so we, we, we couldn't get our luggage on, uh, so we literally just had to throw our luggage into the uh, into the foyer in uh, Rodos uh, Princess Beach Hotel, Liam. not even our hotel. Uh, so we left our luggage there, we had to get on the bus, Went to Gennady uh, Beach, uh, so we were there for about nine hours. Uh, there was a shack there with some water, so we luckily we were hydrated to a certain extent. But then there was power cuts, so then it got dark, you know, couldn't see. Um, it started to touch midnight, one o'clock, and then we, it, it, was, it was made aware that we had to head to the beach because uh, they uh, think you both to come to pick us up to take us to a main boat. 
Um, and, 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 and Liam, this, 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 it's worth saying, this is with, you know, two young children who said eight, eight and four. I can't imagine what you've been through. Uh, Liam, I, and again, we're glad that you're safe and sound. We asked um, Catherine the same question about the organisers. You booked your holiday with Jet2, didn't you? Uh, have you been able yeah. to get hold of them? We've been able to get hold of them after waiting half an hour, but there was nothing. There was just absolute zero battle. There was no contingency plans. There was nothing. Um, if they would say they would get back to us, no one got back to us. We received one two-minute phone call throughout the whole experience, uh, basically seeing where we are. But they didn't even know uh, the school that we were in. It, it wasn't even on their radar. I had to set up what three words uh, location of where it was. Uh, we were there for. 40 hours. It wasn't the best conditions, but the locals were just amazing. They made, made, made sure we were fed, hydrated, and they couldn't have done uh, anything more, to be honest. They were amazing. Um, <laughs> but, but with Jet 2, uh, it's just the situation wasn't good with Jet 2, to be honest. Uh, Liam, I'm conscious. Uh, but that you have got a flight today. You're heading yeah. home today with your small children. Listen, we're glad that you are safe and well and our hearts go out to you because you've navigated all of this with two small children, which is not easy for a dad to watch. So you get yourselves home and, uh, as I say, we're glad that you're safe and well. Catherine is on her way home on Wednesday. Her children are grown up, but children yeah. nonetheless. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, you get yourselves home. Uh, thank you for speaking to us, Catherine. Thank you for speaking to us, Liam. Take care, guys. Thank you. Pleasure. Matt, this is frustrating, it's frightening. I mean, I've got goosebumps listening to that yeah, story. Yeah, it's hard to imagine with two young children having to go what, through on what the back Liam of a dinghy did. for yeah, three hours. Yeah, it really is. It's the last thing they expect when you go on holiday. So, TUI, Jet2, yep. just some of the holiday operators in that area, what have they said? OK, let's take TUI first. Catherine travelled with her family with TUI. Um, it says its team in Rhodes has been working tirelessly to support customers impacted by the wildfires. Five repatriation flights have brought hundreds of customers home. It's working hard to get everyone back as soon as it can. It appreciates how distressing and difficult it's been for those who have been evacuated and ask they continue to follow the advice of the local authorities and keep in touch with its reps who are at all evacuation centres. Jet2, Liam's tour operator, we spoke to Jet2, it said its absolute priority is looking after customers and contacting them, including Liam. It says it did offer Liam and his family seats on repatriation flights but by then he'd already made alternative travel arrangements okay. the situation's moved incredibly quickly it's continued to make decisions in the best interests of its customers including a significantly expanded presence in roads with support for customers and looking after them in evacuation centers resorts roads airport um, it said it put on four repatriation flights to bring customers home yesterday on top of its scheduled program of approximately 50 flights that it will continue to operate from roads to the UK this week Matt, can we help some people here? Because we're hearing that those are two of thousands of stories yeah. at the moment, but there are lots of people who are due to head off on holiday yeah. in the area, don't want to miss out, you know, because thinking yeah. about money as well, they've booked Absolutely. a summer holiday. Absolutely. Emma is one of those uh, people. Um, I have a package holiday booked to Pafkos on Rhodes yeah. on the 9th of August. Uh, I don't want to go and would like to change my destination. Do I have any rights? OK, a couple of things I have to say. Pef, of course, is in the north of Rhodes. It's quite a long way away from the southeast. The, the kind of resorts that we were talking about with Liam and Catherine. The 9th of August is, is nearly two weeks away. Things can change terribly quickly. But the two phrases that stick out to me from what Emma said are don't want to go and rights. If you choose not to go, that's called a disinclination to travel, you lose a lot of your rights to a refund, to compensation, to rebooking. What I would be doing in Emma's case is waiting, keeping in contact with the tour operator, continuing to look at the governments, the Foreign Office uh, and uh, Commonwealth and, and Development Offices, um, their website to see how the advice changes over time. Wait if the tour operator cancels, it's going to put a lot more of the ball in her court in terms of rights. So I'd wait, keep in contact with them and find out how things change. What if you haven't booked a package? What if, like Sarah, you've booked your hotels and your flights separately? Sarah says, I'm supposed to fly out soon. It's not a package holiday. What if my flights are cancelled but my accommodation mm. isn't? OK, so if you book a package, you're protected by the package travel regulations. And that means if any one part of your holiday goes down, changes significantly, you're allowed a, a, you get a refund or you can rebook your choice. The, the difficult bit is when you do book independently because the hotelier may be there waiting for you and say, look, I'm prepared to, prepare, to provide this service. 
how you get here is not my concern. And so that does that make things more difficult. Then you're looking at insurers. And we've seen insurance change quite a deal, really, mm -hmm. in the past few years, because insurers now say my, their primary role is to bring you home in, in an, a, a medical emergency. Some of the insurers don't cover things like natural disasters. You might have to look for insurance that specifically covers it or an add-on. That's what we're seeing a lot of. Mm. Yeah, it can be. And, you know, this is not the last time we're going to be seeing incidents like this. And it's mm. really worth considering carefully where you're going, the risk that you're putting yourself at. And, you know, if that makes sense for you as a product that could protect you if things do go wrong like this. But everybody that's out there, we wish you the very best getting back and, and hope things, you know, quickly resolve themselves. And as Catherine and Liam said, they're just, you know, hats off to people who live yeah. there who yeah. are just showing unbelievable generosity at a yeah. very difficult time. Absolutely. On top of this travel chaos, shockingly, we've seen that fraudsters are already trying to cash in on the emergency by setting up fake airline accounts on social media and offering help uh, to tourists. Uh, if you've received any messages and are worried that they're scams, well, please get in touch. Rav's going to be with us on Morning Live on Thursday to help with that. Now, we're talking about a topic closer to home now. Ranch has been looking into the harmful impact of the material asbestos, which has been built into the fabric of the UK schools. Yeah, for decades it was used in construction, and although it's been banned for years, thousands of people are still dying from cancer after being exposed to it. Almost 100 education workers have died since 2017 because of asbestos exposure in school buildings. And with more UK schools than not still containing asbestos, it's a worry that's not going away. These days, just the word asbestos is enough to strike fear into most of us, as it brings to mind something that is a great threat to our health. But to understand why it's so concerning, it's important to understand what it actually is. Asbestos is a mineral-like substance that was once used in the building industry. It can withstand high temperatures and electricity, and it doesn't corrode. So it became something of a magic material for building insulation, flooring and roofing. And despite the first recorded death linked to asbestos in 1899, it continued to be used in the UK until 1999, when it was finally banned in new building products. But of course, we still use many public buildings, including schools, that began life long before those protections were introduced. The health and safety executive says that the risk from asbestos is negligible if it's in good condition and not damaged or disturbed. Current regulations require those who manage buildings, including schools, that contain asbestos to understand where it is and to make sure it's left alone. If it can't be protected, it must be removed. And there's a lot of it. We know that over 80% of schools across Britain contain some form of asbestos, but most teachers, most parents of pupils don't know that that's the case. Shelley Asquith is the Health and Safety Policy Officer at the Trades Union Congress. She wants the official approach to change from keeping asbestos contained in schools to taking it out altogether. The only way that we can protect people is to get rid of asbestos once and for all. It's been in there for decades. It's at a higher risk of being disturbed because it is so old. There are around 5,000 people each year who die of asbestos-related cancer. That number hasn't been falling in the last few years. But what's been rising steeply is the number of people that are being diagnosed as a result of exposure in schools, so education workers and former pupils. Asbestos can show up in surprising places. Asbestos can be in the ceilings, in the floor tiles, it can be in the window frames, for example, and in the walls. So when teachers are doing things as basic as pinning up displays on a wall, that's when asbestos can be released and exposed in the air, and that's when it becomes really dangerous. Removing asbestos comes at a cost, but not removing asbestos also comes at a cost. Even brief exposure to small amounts of asbestos can cause problems. Inhaling airborne microscopic fibres can cause a type of lung cancer called mesothelioma. Every year, over 2,500 people in Britain die of it. 
It can take as much as four decades after someone comes into contact with asbestos for the cancer to develop. Lucy Stevens' late mum, Sue, was a teacher for 30 years before she retired. She taught hundreds and hundreds of children and absolutely loved that job. Um, really keen on enabling children to come to school and feel safe and loved and start to learn and, and love learning. Sue never thought for a moment that her time in the classroom was potentially putting her life at risk. But in 2014, she was diagnosed with mesothelioma. Mum would spend a lot of time going in and making sure that the environment was really inviting for the children. She'd be putting up pictures all over the place, hanging stuff from the ceilings, really decorating the space, because often it was a bit dark and dingy. And it's only later that we've realised that that was probably disturbing asbestos in those classrooms. We were so upset about the diagnosis. It was such a surprise. Mum was really angry, actually, and couldn't understand how it could have happened. So we started to ask questions and to find out what had happened in those schools that she'd taught in. As we started asking for more information about those schools, it became clear that all of them had contained asbestos and mum had never been told. She was then worried that as a teacher doing what she'd been doing, she'd unwittingly been putting her pupils at risk. So she was really angry and upset about that. Within 18 months of her diagnosis, she was dead. It was really unpleasant for her. It's a really uncomfortable disease and a horrible way to die. Exposure to asbestos is thought to be responsible for up to nine out of 10 cases of mesothelioma. Sue was convinced that spending so much time in school buildings where asbestos was present caused her illness. She started a case against her local authority, which was eventually settled out of court on a full liability basis. And her daughter wants change. My daughter will be in school for another five or six years. My brother's a teacher. There are millions of people going into these buildings every day. It's not right that they're not safe. We contacted the health and safety executive, and this is what they told us. We understand these concerns and sympathise with those impacted by asbestos-related illness. We're open to ideas to improve the current system and continue to consider the latest research. Schools have a legal duty to manage asbestos in their buildings effectively. And during our recent inspection campaign, we did not find any incident of pupils or teachers being exposed to asbestos. It's reassuring to hear the HSE found no incidents of exposure. But Professor Kevin Bampton, CEO of the British Occupational Hygiene Society, thinks there's more to be done. The chances of you getting ill as a student at school are very, very slight indeed, but, but I liken it to a minefield. If you know that asbestos is there and it's managed and you avoid it, then there's no danger. But like a minefield, if you don't know it's there and you wander into it, the risk and the danger can be really very significant. There has never been a better time to replace asbestos in schools as we try and make them healthier, more fit for purpose and more environmentally friendly. Now's the time we can really act and make a difference. Surprisingly, schools aren't obliged to let parents know whether asbestos is present on the premises. But Kevin says that if you are worried, it's a conversation worth having. My kids go to a school which has got a big asbestos pro problem and they've basically locked up one of the buildings. And it does worry me. There are more risks, I think, still with, with getting the kids to school from traffic, etc. Um, this is just one of those risks that you know that if it was managed properly, could just disappear completely. And that's what I like to see. School buildings are a part of everyday life for so many of us, and the reality of so much asbestos being present in them can seem really scary. But remember, unless it's disturbed, there is no immediate danger and a lot of people are working hard to keep it safe until it's removed completely. They are, which is obviously a good thing, because listening to Lucy there talk about her mum was so heartbreaking, wasn't it? Um, thanks, Ranch, for that report. Interesting. Now, we did contact the Department of Education. It said responsibility for keeping build buildings safe and well-maintained lies with responsible bodies such as academy trusts, local authorities, who it provides guidance to so they can manage asbestos thoroughly. <laughs>
The health and safety of its pupils and teachers is so important, which is why it's allocated over £15 billion since 2015 to support this work, including £1.8 billion committed for 2023 to 2024, and it's transforming 500 schools through the school rebuilding programme, they said. Well, for most children, school is now out for the summer and uh, I'm sure there'll be a lot of uh, discussions between parents and grandparents about how to keep them entertained. Discussions? discussions. Yeah. Heated debates, right word? you might say. <laughs> a new BBC Children's and Education programme suggests that screen time might not be too bad after all. <sighs> Dr Amanda Gummer is a child development expert who's advised on the campaign. She's with us now. This is a hot topic. It lit up the office. Should you? Could you? Would you? Can you? Is it all right for children to have screen time? And we're discovering that it's not how long they watch, but it's what they watch, isn't it? Yeah, pretty much. I think, you know, we all know that screen time's here to stay. We can't put that genie back in the bottle. But for us, it's about balance. So giving kids that balanced play diet in the same way that you balance their what they eat, you want to balance what they're doing in their leisure time. So get them down the parks and the playgrounds, get them running around with their friends. And then when they are watching TV, if they've had all of that exercise and the, the good stuff, you can you can relax a bit with the TV, but really making sure that you know what they're watching and that what they're watching is good for them. Mm. Uh, and then Campaign has quite a clear image of what maybe a balanced play diet looks like. Yeah, so um, something that we've developed, and it's a, a model in the, very similar to um, the... the five-a-day kind of campaigns and it's it's about social imaginative active child-led free play so getting the kids down the park with their mates playing pirates and, and imaginative stuff that's the that's the broccoli if you like of the of the play diet if your kids want more of that give it to them if they're hungry and they've got time let them do that the solitary sedentary passive stuff is the sweets and the treats so that's the bit you want to limit but screen time can can have a place in all of that so Getting kids out and about with things like Pokemon Go is fine, but equally making sure that they're watching educational content on TV. And the research showed that over 93% of parents felt that screens were a good source of educational content. So, you know, great. And as part of that balanced play diet, screens have a really important role to play. So, yeah, it is what they're watching on screens and how they're doing it rather than you know, how long they're actually spending. I remember my dad always saying, you know, get out, get outside, get outside and play. So, but, so it's not about just limiting screen time altogether. There's, there's still a little bit of the balance, as you say, between one <coughs> and the two. It's like you can have screen time as long as you're outside as well. Yeah, and set boundaries with your kids and, and make sure you've got that sort of agreement about what they're able to do and when. But, yeah, absolutely, get, get kids outside, enjoy the summer holidays, but don't demonise the screen. My dad, was right. my dad was right. My dad was right, get but outside. It's, but get it's the demonising, like parents, true, guardians, yeah. grandparents up and down the country going, yes, Amanda, it's OK when it's appropriate. You've got some tips because, as you said, screen time isn't going anywhere. Let's not make people feel guilty for using screens. Your first top tip is quality content, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And making sure you know what your kids are watching and that it's age appropriate and good for them. There's lots of really great content, especially on the BBC, obviously. Um, but I think in things like Yakadi and um, Love Monster that teaches kids you know, de developed by experts with, with kids' development in mind, but also teaches kids some really important skills. So Love Monster's great for that emotional development and teaching kids about their feelings. Um, and there's lots of stuff, you know, Bluey and all the... You know, there's some really great content out there. Mm. Once you watch Yakadi, you can't unwatch it. Yakadi, <laughs> Yakadi. It's in my head now, thank you. Yeah. Um, let's talk about routine setting, because that's another tip, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. So... Figure out where screen time fits into your day. You don't want kids on screens 24-7, absolutely not, and it shouldn't interfere with meal times and sleep times. So build it into your, into your daily routine and talk to the kids about when it works. So if at the weekend you want an extra half an hour in bed and they're allowed to go downstairs and put the telly on and watch a bit of something that, that you know, see BBs or something, then great. Then... But then, you know, make sure that there's an agreement. Maybe they have to do jobs before they're allowed to, to go back on the TV or maybe they, they have to have gone and played with a friend or outside or, you know, helped, mm. helped around the house. There, there can be... Negotiation. Yeah, and, and scheduling the, the appropriate content at the, the appropriate time. So something calming and relaxing before bed, you know, for half an hour, absolutely fine. And it helps, it, it helps part of that daily routine and, and it helps kids have that framework to the summer holidays, which can be a bit chaotic. Yeah. Mm. Your third tip, representation. Yeah, so we're seeing so much innovation in this space and it's really great for kids to be able to see 
um, themselves on screen and people and characters that, and situations that they can relate to. So programs like Jojo Grand Grand, um, you know, it's, it's great to be able to give kids a wide um, choice of, of programs and content and characters so that they can see themselves and they if they relate to the content they're much more likely to get the benefits of the educational content that comes through it. Mm. Amanda thank you so much okay I think it's one of the things that stresses parents out the most how mm. much is the right amount and when to do it so thank you so much Amanda. It's loads of useful advice on the website as well CBBS, which we've put on the Morning Live website as well which you can have a look at right now. Thank you. Now, when it comes to adult screen time, one thing us grown-ups might want to watch is a gripping new BBC drama, The Sixth Commandment. The four-part series set in a small village in Buckinghamshire focuses on the true story of a man who befriends local residents with devastating consequences. That is stressful, isn't it? It I makes know. you shiver. It does like, make you shiver. Ugh. It does. We're joined by Annabelle Scully, and, uh, who plays Anne-Marie Blake, and uh, Aina Hardwick, who plays the sinister quite creepy if I may say so, Ben Field. Uh, thanks both for joining us. Uh, I'm already scared of, of, of you, um, uh, Aina, you, just because I'm so used to being on the screen. Are you a, a nice man? Can you just say you're a nice man before we carry on? Aina? I am hopefully a well-reared and nice man. Okay, um, good. <laughs> it's, it's the, the, do you know what I mean? Like You're not sure until you say hello, are you? It's because you're good at what you do. <laughs> um, it's quite, Annabelle, it's quite a story. It's a true story. Can you try and outline what happens? Yes, of course. So this is a four-part drama based on the true story um, uh, set in a very unassuming, lovely community called Maids Morton. And it follows the story of Peter Farker and Anne Moore Martin, who were both very upstanding, integral uh, members of that community, well loved. Um, and they were uh, preyed on by a young man called Ben Field, who ingratiated himself into that community via the church, um, systematically went, went through both of them and manipulated them uh, using uh drugs at one point um i guess both of their stories and their families and then the aftermath after they both died um how the police investigated ben field and then brought him to justice uh, So the court episode four is a lot of the court case um and how the families coped in the aftermath of the tragedies which is Let, tonight. That's tonight's episode, yeah. Tonight. Let's talk yeah. about what it's like to play the character of Benfield, because he's not a character, is he? He's a, he's a real person who affected real families, and you want to get into the, the mindset of him, but, um, you know, you don't want to stay in the mindset. What's it like to do that as an actor? Well, in a way, it starts with, you know, it's the same as, as any other role, in that you start with script, and, and that's kind of... Everything you find has got to be in that. Uh, and we're lucky we've got, you know the most incredible scripts from Sarah Phelps, who had sort of delved into this world for the best part of two years. Um, I mean, I heard her say she had like a stack of documents up to her arm, like, you know, to go through. And and she spent two years going through this painstakingly. So I suppose you, you, you're kind of standing on very firm ground. Uh, and then there was lots I could read. There was lots I could, I could watch. There was people I could talk to connected with the case. Um, so yeah, it was it was highly unusual in that I'd never played a real person before, and you're you're treading that line of wanting to be accurate um, in order to serve the story fully because I felt like that was important, uh, and and not needing to do an impression either, you know, just trying to kind of do all that work in advance and then um, feel confident enough to kind of go with your instinct. Oh, and um, nailed it. It's brilliant. Yeah. Well, thank, thank you. And I mean, it was it was something we all, you know, we were all we were all doing. I suppose we were all playing real people. Yeah. Um, Annabelle, myself, um, the whole the whole gang. So it was, um, yeah. There are lots of different ways to approach it. Mm. And, and real people, but real victims, Annabelle. Like, do you feel a sort of extra weight of responsibility to do them justice, almost? Oh, 100 percent. Yeah, I think it's the most important thing when you're making a drama like this. That it's a very very Actually, uh, Ben wasn't convicted of Anne's murder, so it's very raw. Um, and it was vital that we um, collaborated with the families. I know Sarah uh, Phelps and Saul did, and the producers, who also, um, some of them made the Channel 4 documentary, were so focused on that. And it was really important to all of us that 
this story wasn't glorifying Ben Seals, um, mm. that it was absolutely yeah. about Anne and Peter, who were exceptional, intelligent members of society. They weren't, you know, two old people who were just victims. There was so much more that they brought to their their worlds. And um, I've been reading online all the, the students of both of them and, and, and how they have very different memories of, of those two people. So I think it was really important to everyone, Sarah, that they came across as fully rounded people who were just... I guess in the wrong place at the wrong time. And um, I think it's a lesson to all of us. I think that's why everybody's uh, really taken it into their hearts because yeah. it could happen to anybody. Um, and it's and it's scary and it reminds you to look after the people that you love. Um, so I don't see them as, as victims so much. I see, I, I think it was really important. Obviously they are to a certain extent, but I think it's important to show who they really were and, and how, how hard their families worked to make sure that they got justice. And I think that is the focus of the drama and why it works so well. Thank you so much for, for giving us a bit of an insight. And as we say, it's testament to both of your skills that we are so, I don't know, it gets in, yeah. you said it gets into your soul, doesn't it? Thank you, guys. Uh, thank you very much. Now, the final episode of The Sixth Commandment is on tonight at nine on BBC One, and you can watch all the episodes now on iPlayer. We're on to the case of a group of Asian hornets now who are on the loose in the UK. Since their arrival in 2016, the predators have been wiping out bees and other insects, which are so important to the local ecosystem. Mm. Each year, it falls on a band of two dozen volunteers to find and capture their flying foes. So we're going back to the island of Jersey to see just what it takes to track them down. Alistair Christie and this group of volunteers are at the forefront of the fight against a vicious predator that is threatening the local environment here in Jersey. Asian hornets are one of the largest members of the wasp family and each can catch and kill up to 50 honeybees a day. We just don't know the long-term impacts on our native insect and pollinator population. So for these volunteers, the race is on to locate nests which could contain thousands of hornets. Our aim is to track, find the hornet nests so that they can be destroyed because they will be taking out all the pollinators in Jersey. In France, they have really taken hold after being inadvertently imported on freight from China. In France, they reckon that about 30% of beehives are affected by Asian hornets each year, and that can be from being wiped out to just weakened so that they don't survive the winter. A beekeeper for many years, Alistair is the Asian Hornet Coordinator for Jersey. He oversees a network of volunteers who are specifically trained and licensed. Volunteers are a diverse group of people a good number of them are beekeepers because they have a vested interest, but a lot of them are just outdoorsy people. You also have to factor in the thrill of the hunt. The aim is to find as many of these as possible before the hornets mate in early autumn. Once we know that we've definitely got hornets in the area, we ring fence it with traps. Once we find them in the traps, we can start marking them, timing them, and using a map and triangulation, we can see which direction they're going in. Biodiversity loss is a big issue and what can we do to make a difference and to, to help and it's a bit of a thrill you're kind of scared to get stung but you just sort of get used to it. Today these volunteers have uncovered a nest in a very tricky spot completely tangled up. It's a bomb disposal thing you if you cut the wrong piece of twig the nest falls and you are in big trouble. Preparing for this nest's removal is going to take a few days. But in the meantime, Alistair is called to another, which has been spotted in a treetop. Well, this nest is a perfect example of public involvement. Two sightings were recorded nearby. Our volunteers came in and within 48 hours we'd found the nest. For a nest this high, Alistair calls in a specialist tree surgeon. I reckon it's probably the second biggest this year. Yeah. It's a bit bigger than a football. In a nest of that sort of size, there may be up to about a thousand hornets. This probably has been the hardest one. It's just climbing up to it, really. It's part of doing the job, I guess, so you've got to be willing to take the risks. The only time that I've actually got scared was when I got stung. It did hurt. Matt climbs up as close as he can before injecting the nest with an approved pesticide. The next day, he retrieves the nest to be analysed and disposed of safely. This nest has been formed so recently, this will all be eggs. 
very well done in retrieving this. We know if we stop doing what we're doing, then Hornet numbers will accelerate in Jersey and then we will be seeing the impacts on our ecology, our economies and to people as well. We won't be able to get back from that. Definitely need to look after those honeybees for sure. Uh, Matt, as you can imagine, after chatting to Catherine and Liam at the top of the show, who are stuck at the moment in Greece, we've had lots of reaction, haven't we, this morning? Yeah, absolutely. One thing we need to clear up as well, within the island of Rhodes, there are numerous, there are a number of places called Pefkos. One of those, yes, is in the southeast. Oh, that was Emma, that, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So it just goes to underline, before you go to Rhodes, before you go to Greece, just check exactly where you're going with your provider. And very important, if you are struggling to get through to your provider, just keep going, keep persisting. They will be there and they will be able to advise you. That's your first port of call. And Thank you, Matt. As we said yesterday, stick with us and keep your eye on the BBC News for the, as it develops and as things change over the next few days. Now, though, it is time for Strictly Fitness with Maria. So, cue the music. Maria, Maria. Good morning. Are we ready for Strictly? Oh, yes. Now, the theme this week is girl power in honour of the Women's World Cup. Yes. What moves have you got for us today, Maria? So we're going to pick up the energy today with a sizzling salsa step from uh, Alexandra and Gorka's salsa routine. And that is the move that we're going to do right there. Yeah. We new can't, father. See, we can't see Gorka. Gorka without saying congratulations yeah. on little Tiago. Tiago, welcome to the world. All right, warm us up then, what are we doing first? So before we start, we're going to start with our first form of move, which is going to be arm up to the air and lift the opposite knee. Beautiful. We're going to do this to the opposite side four times. Beautiful. So it's like a little bit of a marching step. Our second one is our wood chop. So I want you to make two fists, bring them together, and we're going to go diagonal and down. Beautiful. <coughs> and we're going to do this twice. And then we're going to do it to the other side. So we're going to go diagonal to the left and then down one more. And Good for the gold swing, that one. <laughs> and for our strictly move, we're going to stretch the arms out and point the foot. Beautiful. One to the other side. And then we're going to do a star. Beautiful. Okay. Take it away, Alan. With a mid-body wood.